On behalf of the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, we thank you for attending today's presentation, Should You Suspect the Female Athlete Triad, with Dr. Lisa Woodruff, sports medicine physician, and Becca Mallon, clinical sports dietitian. Our faculty's goal is to share information you can use about the latest therapies and techniques in medicine and answer your questions about how to partner with us in the care of your patients. These are informational presentations to enhance your clinical practices and to provide you with the most updated information we have. No CME credit is provided at this time. This program is being recorded and will be posted to our educational resources for referring physicians webpage. If you do have questions following your viewing of this presentation, please feel free to reach out to your provider relations manager or Dr. Woodruff um, or Becca Mellon if you have any questions regarding the topics. At this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Woodruff and she'll start the presentation. Hello, my name is Lisa Woodruff. Like she said, I'm one of the sports medicine phys physicians here at the University of Iowa. I'm kind of specializing in our female athlete population and some of the uh, medical management related to unique issues that can um, arise in that population. And one of the things that I the most frequently, not only in my um, sports medicine practice, but also in my general pediatrics practice, um, is uh, the various components that kind of touch on this issue of female athlete triad or um, another name that people commonly think of or hear about is this red S. And so we're going to touch on that today. Um, as she said, we have of our sports dietitians along with us today too, who's a very integral part of managing these patients. Um, so she will uh, join in with us as well. So getting started, I just wanted to start with some definitions. You'll hear these terms or you may hear these terms when you start looking into female athlete triad or just female athletes or uh, athletes in general. But one of the terms that is Yes, like I said, is this red S. And what is that? So by definition, red S is relative energy deficiency in sport, or very simply, uh, an imbalance in input and output. So when an athlete expends more energy than he or she consumes, um, another term that you might hear is low energy availability, which we'll get into a little bit later. The, the way I think about red S is really as an umbrella term. This is clearly a very simple but broad definition. Um, and so it really is an umbrella term of which we start to see small subsets of problems or conditions arise within. Um, but at the core of it, again, it, it really re comes down to an energy imbalance. This was, um, it, it becomes confusing because although this is sort of a parent term or an umbrella term, this term was not the first term used to define um, issues related to energy availability. This was actually an updated term. The term female athlete triad did come out first and then Red S was established more as an update when we realized once we got into studying this that there were certainly more components than just the three components that the triad describes. So you'll see here, I, I like this diagram because it, it sort of um, touches on what I mentioned here in a, in a pictorial form. So you have red S in the center here, which as you would know, if, you're, if we're really just talking at the basics of energy imbalance, this could touch on all of the different organ systems. Uh, there could be many, uh, many manifestations of this symptomatically and with different signs and things you would pick up in clinic. Um, and then of that subset, uh, there are three that have been classically picked out as defining the triad. So here in the corner, the things that we see are low energy availability at one end of the or uh, one corner of the triad and then menstrual uh, dysfunction and bone health. But the key here, the reason that they will, um, the reason this was updated is because we realized that there really needed to be a broader sense of how we look at these athletes beyond just those organ systems and 
beyond just female athletes um, or beyond potentially just athletes. Um, it's not limited. So the definition of red S is certainly not limited to females, it includes all genders, age, uh, pe sport participation levels, um, sport types, body sizes, et cetera. So they just really wanted to sort of shake some of the uh, stereotypes that started to come when we, when we said just the word female athlete triad. So female athlete triad though classically was the first described and so therefore it really does have probably the most um, research behind it. We've, we've looked into this the longest and so a lot of the guidelines and the things that I do use in clinic are tailored really from the, the work coming out of those who have worked with female athlete triad. Um, specifically. So we will dive into this a little bit more, but again, realizing that this is one small piece of the pie when we're looking at a patient head to toe. So the female athlete triad, by definition, is a spectrum of disorders um, involving those three things as I touched on earlier. Uh, the reason I really like this graph, I use it all the time, um, is to really, to really realize that this is a spectrum of disorders. Uh, classically, people thought of the triad as only these uh, components that are seen down here on the red end of the spectrum. So uh, classically, the stereotype that people thought of with female athlete triad was an eating disorder, someone who had not had a period or was not having any periods, and then someone who had weak bones, uh, stress fractures, diagnosed osteoporosis. So certainly that is, um, those are all manifestations that we can see within female athlete triad, but that would be what I would consider the worst case scenario. And when we've sort of missed the ball completely, when we have made it all the way to that end of the spectrum without having any positive intervention for these patients. So we know that we can catch these things much earlier and we can see various more subtle to be fair, but various other findings on their way to becoming such uh, severe uh, findings at the end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, where we want people to be is, is in that green triangle up in the upper right hand corner. So optimal energy availability or input matching output, optimal bone health and having regular periods once a month or eumenorrhea. And so that's where we want people to be. And as I said, people can be anywhere along the spectrum in any one of those components. People don't always show up to my clinic saying, hey, I have four stress fractures, I skip my periods, and I have an eating disorder. They don't, they don't manifest that way. They manifest much more subtly, and maybe they only have one arm of those symptoms, and then I go digging for the others. They tell me they come into my sports medicine practice with a, a stress fracture, and maybe they've had one this year, maybe they had one three or four years ago. But that triggers me to start asking about some of these other things. You know, what are their periods like? What is their diet like? What has their weight been like? Um, and so when, and sometimes if you don't go digging for those things, you don't find those things because they can be subtle and or they might not come to um, medical attention without, without you specifically asking. Why does this pertain to a sports medicine practice per se. You know, we've really, I've talked so far a lot of, about a lot of organ systems and how we really need to maintain optimal health. And, and that sounds good and well, and certainly good for any physician to think about. But when it comes to a sports medicine practice and how I try to sell this to athletes themselves is a lot of these things when it comes to female athlete try to boil down to their bone health. And, and when we're looking at their bone health, this is how I sort of frame it um, from an injury risk standpoint and how we can keep them active and keep them doing the things they love while staying healthy. And so I kind of bring them back a little bit to some basic bone physiology um, and do a lot of teaching in the room. So when we think about bones, you know, I think a lot of the lay um, people in our patients think about bones as sort of just solid structures that are holding us up as we walk around in the world. Um, I don't think patients realize how metabolically active our bones are. And so I touch on this a little bit. And as you can see here, you know, this is our basic schematic of 
bone remodeling. And so bones are highly metabolically active. They're highly dynamic tissues. They're constantly turning over. And um, we have sort of the four stages of bone remodeling listed there at the top where they start with a canopy layer of cells. And then there's a resorptive phase of the bone before there's a formation phase of the bone. And then finally mineralization at the end. But clearly there's these moments in time where there's more, there was resorption before there's formation. And you have these continual vulnerable periods where you don't have a, a perfect balance of, of bone amount, bone density or bone quality. And I sort of relay this to patients in a couple of different ways. And, and we know that we, we can see that bones are so metabolically active because they receive 10% of our cardiac output. In a, in a resting state. So they really are receiving a lot of these nutrients and energy needed to do this on a constant basis. Um, your skeleton is actually regenerated uh, completely every 10 years or so. Um, so again, just to, to point out that this is a highly dynamic, constantly turning over process. And so when this becomes an unbalanced process, you can see how this could run into problems when we already have vulnerable moments, when we alter the balance either way, when we alter how the resorptive phase is going or the formation phase is, is going, we really can um, have a significant influence on the quality of these bones. When there's unbalanced remodeling, you risk bone reduction or in some cases when we need it, um, bone growth. So there's kind of some definitions, background, physiology, refresh. The management and testing and, and screening side of things here, I really base a lot of my clinical practice based on these uh, clinical guidelines. The most recent update was in 2014. Again, it really does focus on female athlete triad because we have the most evidence here, not saying this is the end all be all, but um, it's, it's a good starting point, I think, when we start to think about these things and try to figure out what we need to be looking for and what we need to be um, doing in our clinical practice. And so I, I um, hold this document close to me at all times. Um, looking at the numbers here, just a little bit of um, backgrounds on the importance or who might be coming into your clinic and you might not even notice or, or know the true prevalence of the number of patients out there who have these conditions is unknown, which makes sense. When we're talking about those subtle differences and spectrum disorders, it, it could easily go undetected. And in our studies are not great. Um, and certainly we believe that they are underrepresenting what's actually going on for a number of reasons. So our true prevalence is unknown, but you can see here that for different components of the triad, they can get fairly high in numbers in certain at-risk populations. So for the general population to skip a period more than three months in a row, that's about two to 5% um, prevalence. When we start looking at certain subsets of uh, female athletes, we see that that jumps all the way up to close to 70%. So you see there's a study in dancers 69% of dancers had secondary and menorrhea, 65% of long distance runners. Clearly this is not every long distance runner, not every long distance team has that sort of uh, prevalence, but when the studies that we have looked at have suggested this is much higher than the general population. When we look at the arm of disordered eating, uh, we see the same. The general population, um, it's estimated about between five and 10% with the actual DSM diagnosis. That has been shown to be higher in certain female athlete subsets. Uh, the studies here listed um, those in lean sports, um, one of which would be gymnastics. So there was another study that looked at college gymnasts. And then the third arm of this, um, low bone mineral density. That's been shown to be anywhere as high as 21% uh, of all female athletes having weaker bones than we would expect them to have for their age and the amount of weight bearing activity that they've done. So diving into the components of this then, low energy availability. What exactly does that mean? What's the equation that we're going off of? It's a basic equation. 
energy availability is your energy intake minus your energy expenditure in physical activity. So that is what is left for you, left for the patient, available for them to carry out their metabolic processes. The um, threshold that has been determined for optimal health, including maintaining eumenorrhea and optimal bone health has been set at um, ideally 45 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. And this is, this is the threshold, it's certainly not the highest um, that a person may need, but it's, a, it's been determined as the threshold. And so to put this into a context, if you had a 5'8", 123 pound um, athlete patient, that puts a BMI at 18.7 to put it into perspective, the energy availability calculation would say that that person needs about 2,100 calories per day available after they have worked out, available for all of their metabolic processes. Below that number is when they start, they would start to have a lower bone remodeling rate, a risk of amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, um, and increased risk for energy or for injury. Um, we know that those who, as, a, as an example, there has been a study that showed that those with an actual DSM diagnosed eating disorder, so clearly have been, have fallen under that threshold, are at a seven times higher risk of a fracture, just um, based on energy availability alone. So I really, um, I really go through this and I'm so glad now that we have Becca um, on board to get into the nitty gritty of some of these calculations for patients because I think a lot of times patients and parents um, just have no idea really what the needs are for their athletes. And so when we break this down, you know, that 2100 calories for this pretend patient is what they need to add to whatever they're burning with their workout every single day. So it's going to change depending on what their workout was that day and how many calories you would estimate that they would have burned with that workout. The more that they would have done in a workout, the more they need to add to that 2100 to take in as a total number for their day to cover their total needs. 2100 is not their total needs. It's what they need to add to their workout needs. So notice that so far, um, low, I've not said some specific words that you might be wondering about. So low energy availability does not mean weight loss or low weight. Um, patients who come in with low energy availability, you might not um, think it by per se looking at them. Um, they might not think it because they might not have had significant weight changes in the last six months to a year. Um, you know, homeostasis can work uh, for a while to sort of hang on to the balance of things. So athletes may come in having a stable body weight, but low energy availability. They may come in having a normal body weight, normal BMI, but low energy availability. Depends on where you catch them in the process. You know, the body works to reduce metabolism in certain areas. They may have already lost their periods, which saves um, a significant amount of energy because they are not needing that expenditure. Um, and they do have reduced energy for other cellular maintenance and other body processes that slow down. So they, the body can compensate for a while. So depending on where you see them, do not expect to always see a rail thin athlete with a low BMI on the chart walking in to, to suspect low energy availability. The other thing I have specifically not said is an eating disorder. So low energy availability is certainly not always intentional or even associated with poor body image. Um, certainly this is a subset of the patients that I see, but there is a large uh, portion of these patients as well that just don't have an awareness, like I said, of what they need to be taking in on any given day. And it really is just an educational, um, educational, problem, getting them to realize what their needs are, uh, how significant their needs are, how those needs are different from maybe other people in the family or their roommates or other people around them and why they need to think about food differently than their non-athlete uh, counterparts need to think about food. They also need to think about food. They can't just go about their day skipping from class to class and sort of 
not incorporate food in, into their training regimen. And certainly Becca can, can hit on that too, but I just want to say that this, this is certainly can be an inadvertent um, problem that many athletes find themselves in. Um, the arm of menstrual dysfunction, again, this is, a, this is a spectrum. I would say this one is on the harder end to detect because certainly we know when girls are skipping periods and we know when they're having regular periods, but there's a lot of subtleties in between that really are hard to pick up on um, and you know, require close tracking, require the patient even realizes what's going on. But to be just aware that there are some pre-amenorrheic steps that, that occur. Um, one of the other common ones that I have seen in my pediatric practice would be delayed menarche. So girls who should have had their periods by the age of 15 but have not yet had their first period. And there are certainly other reasons for that, but one of the reasons that could lead to this would be female athlete triad or red S. Other uh, conditions would just be, could just be luteal suppression, anovulation, um, skipping periods, and then all the way to not having any periods at all. So obviously the challenge with this is that it seems that a lot of athletes, I won't say most, that might be a, aggressive, but a lot of athletes are okay with missing periods. I think our culture shift is changing there a little bit, but I wouldn't say that every 14 year old through 18 year old out there is particularly worried about that and might find that that's actually a good thing to not have the annoyance of bleeding once a month. Um, the other thing that unfortunately I do see still to this day is reports that people say, well, I thought that's how I knew I was training enough. I, I gauged and my coach gauged my training based on whether or not I had my period. If I still had my period, I was not training enough. When I lost my period, that's when I knew I was doing enough. I thankfully hear that less and less than I used to, but I do still hear that. And then the other thing that comes up is that, you know, since it might not be something that they perceive as a problem, they think they're okay with missing periods, but also they might not perceive as a reason to bring up in a clinical setting or certainly not a reason to bring up in a sports medicine setting or a, a symptom to bring up in a sports medicine setting, but they don't think to tell me about their periods. Athletes, especially in a sports medicine setting or if, they're, if, we're, if they came in to talk about their stress fractures, they would not necessarily think to bring up, oh, by the way, I also want to tell you that I've skipped the last four periods in a row. So for, for a lot of reasons here, menstrual dysfunction can be difficult to come to medical attention. By definition, amenorrhea, a um, couple of subsets. So one primary amenorrhea would be delayed menarche or delayed first period. So like I said, after 15 years, um, we would expect all females to have their first periods. Secondary amenorrhea is uh, by definition, the loss of periods for three months in a row once a girl has been previously well-established. So we certainly give some wiggle room to those who are in their first couple of years after starting their periods. So those in the 13 to 17 year category, if if they had recently started their periods, we don't expect them to be regular immediately. So there is some wiggle room there. Um, and then the American College of Sports Medicine defines this just a little bit differently, but absence of cycles for 90 days or three consecutive cycles. Oligomenorrhea, on the other hand, is anything where the interval between periods is uh, greater than 35 days. So anything beyond that would be considered too few of periods. You end up skipping them in a total year. Bringing uh, us back to physiology here just a little bit. This is the kind of classic diagram that you see in sort of any endocrinology um, class. This one pertaining to the hypothalamic um, pituitary uh, gonadal access. So just a reminder that, you know, this is a top-down um, sort of 
hormone control, but there's also a lot of feedback involved in the hormone control of our gonadal um, hormones. So speaking in the female sense of estrogen and progesterone. So from the hypothalamus, you have your gonadotropic releasing hormone um, stimulating the pituitary to release uh, LH and FSH, which, which stimulates the ovary to release estrogen and progesterone. And then at various points along your cycle, there is a negative feedback effect here that goes back up the chain as well. When we have enough estrogen and progesterone around, the um, hypothalamus can um, bring down its amount of stimulating hormone. What we see here though, in this particular issue of female athlete triad is that we have such low energy that the signal does not even come from the hypothalamus. It's a central problem where we do, we see low amounts of GnRH, low amounts of LH, FSH, and low amounts of estrogen and progesterone. So athlete comes into the clinic and for one reason or another, we've come to the point where we've, di we've discovered that they are not having periods regularly or they're skipping them completely. You know, in my medical practice, I see it as my job to rule out a lot of the other reasons that are possible for skipping periods. Certainly, we talk about female athlete triad being the most common reason I would see this. However, that's a diagnosis of exclusion. There's no specific test for female athlete triad. And so really the way to arrive at the diagnosis is by excluding a, a sort of long list of other things that can lead to amenorrhea as well. And so this is sort of the list that I will go through and, and include in my workup for ruling out other things. Pregnancy, obviously, always number one. Um, PCOS, a condition that certainly I am not the expert on, but is something that would be the most common endocrinopathy in young adult women, um, up to 10% of some of the numbers that I've seen quoted, um, that do lead to oligomenorrhea, amenorrhea, uh, usually signs of hyperandrogenism as well. Um, other things that we can see are thyroid dysfunction, hyperandrogenism for other reasons, ovarian insufficiency, so more of a peripheral um, problem rather than a central problem, a rare genetic, thing, genetic condition such as Turner syndrome, autoimmune ophritis, and then back to the central causes such as hypothalamic or pituitary insufficiency, pituitary tumors um, are on the list, and then um, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea would be the diagnosis of exclusion for low energy availability or female athlete triad. So bringing it back then to our bones, you know, why does all of this period discussion uh, really play uh, in on our bone health? So kind of back to our remodeling model here, estrogen has a very well known and established role in our bone remodeling. It, it inhibits osteoclasts and maintains our bone mineral density. So kind of my long list here, low estrogen leads to uh, increased osteoclastic activity, which then will release calcium into the serum and through negative feedback will then decrease your calcium uptake or absorption as well. So not only are you increasing your osteoclastic activity, but you're sending signals to your body to decrease the amount of calcium that it should be absorbing as well. So it kind of creates a double hit where you um, have risk factors for weaker bones. The research, um, as far as the clinical significance of this, really is um, more weighted toward the postmenopausal age group, where we really have seen a lot of the effects of lack of estrogen, but there is more and more coming out in the amenorrheic uh, younger premenopausal group as well. But as an example, what we know in menopause is that there is a 20 to 60 milligram a day loss of calcium. They lose 13% of their total body mass of calcium in about 10 years, and they are at increased risk for stress injuries. Similarly, in girls who should be having periods but are not, we see with amenorrhea specifically, so skipping more than three 
we see that there is a two to three percent bone mineral density loss per year and uh, two to four times greater stress injury risk. This is specifically excluding just for the estrogen component that is uh, kind of irrespective of what the energy status is or other components of the bone health risks um, as well. So just for missing periods, you are at a two to four times greater risk of stress injury. I will touch on this briefly. There's a lot of words on this slide, but I, I feel like I do become very bone heavy in these discussions with female athletes. And just to remind us all that this is not just a bone problem. This is a systemic problem and low energy availability and lack of estrogen really does have effects on more than our bones and more on our health that we should all care about and I do care about as these patients physicians. One of the things that has been the most well studied is the cardiac effects of, of lack of estrogen. So again, kind of extrapolating from the postmenopausal population, we know that estrogen plays a significant role in heart disease. We know that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in women in the United States, and the risk drastically increases postmenopausal. Premenopausal, the rate of heart disease, the risk of heart disease is lower in women, but becomes drastically higher in women um, in the postmenopausal age group. I have a lot of uh, things listed here as to what estrogen contributes to that could relate to your um, heart disease uh, risk factors, including de decreased nitric oxide, increased oxidative stress, your inflammatory cascade. Um, it certainly, we know, alters your lipid profile. And we think this all leads to increased endothelial dysfunction and accelerated progression of atherosclerosis. Interestingly, back to the athlete population, this remains true. These cardiovascular risk factors remain true in well-trained weight-stable athletes. So it is not just the athletes who have other risk factors of metabolic syndrome or are overweight, have high blood pressure. These risk factors are higher just for having lack of estrogen. I have found similar, newer, but similar research to be coming out with the female athlete triad as well. We certainly know in um, anorexia and eating disorders, there has been good research showing the cardiac risk uh, involved there. But with female athletes specifically, we do, we, have, we do have stuff that has come out related to cardiovascular risk. And we do think that the pathophysiology is similar to what is going on in menopause. We feel like there is decreased endothelial function in those who have female athlete triad compared to those who are eumenorrheic and have um, optimal uh, bone health. And one of the things that has been um, well studied is this flow mediated vasodilation. So just as an example, this is something that can be measured. Um, one group has demonstrated how to potentially measure this with Doppler ultrasound. And this would be how responsive your blood vessels are to increased blood flow that per se would happen during exercise or other times. But as a, as a marker of your endothelial function and health, how well are they responding to increase and decrease flow? And what has been shown is that this flow mediated vasodilation can vary up to 50% during 50 during different phases of the menstrual cycle. So we know that it does vary with estrogen. And we know that now there is a uh, association between uh, female athlete triad and some of these same end uh, organ effects. So this study, um, specifically, just to kind of briefly go through it, uh, looked at amenorrheic, oligomenorrheic athletes compared to controls, and they did test their endothelial function via that ultrasound test of their flow-mediated vasodilation. The baseline readings were not significantly different, but their response to exercise when they had increased blood flow was significantly less in the amenorrhea group compared to the control or eumenorrhea group. So it's important for more than just your bones. So how am I looking at this in clinic? There is a lot to this like that is screening. I, like I said, you're gonna have to go digging for some of this when just a stress fracture presents itself or just lack of period presents itself or just I 
I'm having trouble with my thoughts around food presents itself. These things, um, we, we know that we need to go looking for other things. And so there are various screening tools out there. This one listed here is specifically taken from that female athlete tribe consensus from 2014. This one has not specifically been validated, but it is longer and it shows you at least the things that we would be asking for. Uh, there are other validated tools out there, some that lean more towards eating disorders, some that lean more towards athlete populations specifically. There hasn't been a great consensus on which screening tool to use, but there is consensus on screening for other components of the female athlete triad when one presents itself to you. So you can see some of the questions listed here. Have you ever had a menstrual period? Do you skip menstrual periods? How many do you skip? What has your weight been doing? Do you skip periods because you're on a birth control pill and that's how you take your birth control pill or you have an IUD? Um, you know, how do other people talk about food around you? How do you feel about food? Have you ever been diagnosed with an eating disorder? Have you ever had a stress fracture or even shin splints that kept you out for a significant amount of time? So things to be asking for. Things that I'm looking for on exam would include Hopefully none of these in clinic. These would be signs of more significant or progressed um, conditions. However, good things to be on the lookout for. Certainly red flags would be listed here. Anyone who's orthostatic has a significantly low heart rate. Now those numbers can certainly be debated as to what is defined as stable or unstable, but it certainly would um, suggest that something else is at play here or something that you should be monitoring for if we do get into those significantly low heart rates. Again, doesn't necessarily mean anything is specifically wrong, but something that should pique your interest. Low BMI, low estimated, um, or low weight based on what we would expect their body weight to be, especially um, in the under 20 age group, we really try to use their growth charts more than we would be using uh, BMIs. Um, any sort of cardiac symptoms or cardiac arrhythmias, uh, hair changes, nail changes, skin changes, uh, uh, dental changes. And one of the things that I find most frequently comes up in my review of systems would be GI symptoms. So symptoms of feeling full, bloated, um, significant troubles with constipation and abdominal pain related to that. I would say that that's the, that is what I find most commonly in my clinic. And then uh, where do I take it from there? Uh, so this list sort of tails back to that list of things that I'm trying to rule out. Uh, so I, I see my testing as two, the role it plays is twofold. Number one, to rule out other causes of either weight loss, amenorrhea or low bone mineral density. And then while I'm at it, also evaluate for any nutritional deficiencies. And so the list, uh, you see here kind of covers those two goals. The other testing that I do quite frequently is bone mineral density testing. It's the best we have so far as looking at bone quality from a non-research standpoint. Um, the, the recommendations are listed here. You qualify for a DEXA scan if you have more than one oh, of these high risk triad risk factors or two moderate risk triad risk factors. And you can see those listed here. So honestly, anyone who has a significantly low weight, anyone with an eating disorder, anyone who has not had a period when at the age of 16 or up, or anyone who's skipping um, periods or is an amenorrheic to the point of less than six uh, periods in the last 12 months, even if they have never had a stress fracture. Even if their weight is normal, they are qualifying for bone mineral density testing. So this is something that I am not, um, not doing infrequently. What do I do when I get them back? It is important to know I'm looking for very specific questions. Um, and our sports medicine definitions are certainly different than um, the world of endocrinology. So by definition from the American Academy uh, or College of Sports Medicine, we define low bone mineral density in an athlete as a C-score less than negative one in a female athlete who, or any athlete who is in a weight bearing sport. What we presume is that someone who has been doing regular amounts of weight bearing activities should have a higher 
bone mineral density than those age matched peers who are not doing regular weight bearing activity. So we hold them to a higher standard. Anything less than negative one, we would call by definition low bone mineral density and it puts them at risk. Osteoporosis per se cannot be um, labeled in the premenopausal and certainly not adolescent population until they have a significantly low Z-score, less than negative two, uh, in addition to a cl clinically significant fracture. So they cannot be di diagnosed with osteoporosis um, and just by DEXA testing alone, they have to have a clinically significant finding along with it. When I talk to patients, I say, you know, now we've picked apart a lot of these different things. We've kind of gone down the rabbit hole of your periods. We've gone down the rabbit hole of your weight. We've picked apart sort of what your stress injury risk has been. And how does this all tie back together? Well, it all adds up. There's one good study that showed, I mean, it, it's not the exact same risks that I'm looking at per se in their verbiage, like the participation in leanness sport. But point being, if you start to add up these risk factors, the risk does add up. Someone who has five, three or four of these factors listed here has an odds ratio of 4.5 for a stress injury. Someone who has five or six of these uh, risk factors, it has an odds ratio of 14.6 for a stress injury. So the more things you start to include as risk factors, the quicker your risk for a bony stress injury goes up direction. So what do we do about this? How do we manage all of these components? Certainly we kind of get into a wide variety of potential topics and so it really does take a multidisciplinary team to manage these patients. As, from a physician role, I really do see my role as determining medical stability, determining if there are other causes of um, amenorrhea, weight loss, other things that I need to be chasing down and treating, and then getting them to their appropriate uh, providers that can really delve into some of these things and, and do the hard work with these patients. And so the two biggest team members that I recommend having for these patients would be a sports dietitian and a, a psychologist or some Sort of mental health provider that really is interested in these patients and even better if they have worked with athletes and sort of the athlete mentality in the past. Certainly if you work with a sports team, you're, you are working very closely with your athletic trainers and your strength and conditioning uh, staff as well. The overall goal here is to restore energy availability. That is the end all be all. Energy availability will get your bone risk back where it needs to be. It will get your periods back where they need to be, which will also affect your bone health. The bottom line is restoring your energy availability. I do have certain subsets like my college population where we can sort of get into the nitty gritty of what this risk means for their sport participation. That gets harder in some of the community athletes where we just don't have that sort of control over what they're doing. But there are, um, there are guidelines out there for maybe what these patients should be doing from a participation standpoint due to their risk of stress injury. And so, and I'll show you the chart coming up here in a couple slides, but low risk would be fully cleared, moderate risk for stress injury. You should consider plugging them in with the treatment team. And as long as things are going well, then they're cleared. High risk for stress injury, maybe we need to look at altering their participation level in some way. Other things that I'm doing from a medical standpoint, obviously treating, following up on any of those abnormal tests that I would gather, specifically monitoring their vitamin D uh, levels and, and intake, um, continually reminding them about their calcium supplementation, and then monitoring things. Well, the biggest thing that I would monitor would be their bone mineral density and their periods. Um, we'll jump into the periods here in a little bit, but. Bone mineral density, you know, the recommendation is continue if we feel like it's safe, weight-bearing exercise. Um, depending on what that DEXA shows, we may or may not repeat it. Most often we're not repeating that and certainly not before a year. Um, but we do know that a couple of things that we don't do are uh, bisphosphonates 
and uh, oral contraceptive pills. Those we know clearly in this population, the bisphosphonates are teratogenic and should not ever uh, be considered for this particular uh, condition. Oral contraceptive pills used historically, but we know that they are not effective and might even be harmful when it comes to um, bone remodeling. And so those are things that we do not do. Again, we are monitoring these things, hoping that their nutritional restoration will do the work that is needed. It really doesn't take much as far as nutritional restoration sometimes to get back your periods. However, it can take a long time. It may take months to even have up to a year after a patient is nutritionally restored for periods to come back. And it's sometimes hard to wait <laughs> that long um, for some signs of, of improvement there. This is kind of a diagram showing those same things. So certainly you can make improvements on certain parameters very quickly. Um, you can improve your energy store, you can improve your blood glucose, you can improve your orthostatics pretty quickly. Um, you, you can consider recovery of menstrual status in any time frame. Um, bones do take a little bit longer. This is the sort of risk stratification that I use. Um, again, I use it mostly in the college population, but I do show this to parents of my non-college athletes as well for the, just kind of indicating why I'm thinking about their risk factors the way I do, because it clearly puts them in low, moderate, and high risk categories. And then if, if we really are starting to add up the risk, we may need to consider looking at how much pounding activity that they're doing, purely from a standpoint of trying to prevent a season altering or greater uh, bone stress injury. So the last topic I will touch on is uh, this very new research on transdermal estrogen. So just last year, 2019, coming out of Boston, there have been a couple of studies looking at the role of transdermal estrogen in this exact population, female, oligo, or amenorrheic athletes, and whether or not we can do anything else besides nutritional restoration to help their bone mineral density. And what they found is that so far in early data, we do think that this transdermal estrogen um, can work. So they did a randomized control trial. The first one was back in spring of 2019 that uh, randomized 121 female athletes within this age range, 14 to 25, to either a protocol of transdermal estrogen and a mini pill uh, or the classic oral contraceptive pill or placebo for 12 months. All of these um, athletes were sort of monitored uh, in their energy intake and received vitamin D and calcium throughout this time as well. And they found significant differences in the patch versus the pill versus placebo, both at six and at 12 months when they measured um, repeat DEXAs. This particular study looked at bone and mineral density and DEXA scores. There was another study that came out in October that looked at other markers of um, bone quality as well. Why transdermal? You know, again, we've always historically heard these girls being put on oral contraceptive pills. Well, we know that oral contraceptive pills uh, do undergo first pass uh, hepatic metabolism, which alters the estrogen form and it makes it less bioavailable, bioavailable and less bioactive than um, the native estrogen or estradiol. So transdermal does not undergo that first pass hepatic metabolism. It also does not suppress IGF-1, which is a bone tropic hormone, which we think um, is the reason why OCPs have not been effective and have maybe been harmful in this population because OCPs have been shown to suppress IGF-1 levels. Um, we also know that OCPs have a dose dependent relationship with the amount of sex hormone binding globulin that's produced, which the more uh, sex hormone binding globulin produced, 
the less active or free or bioavailable estradiol that will be circulating. And so for a couple of reasons, they've postulated that this transdermal would work when oral contraceptive pills have not. Okay, I am going to turn it over here to Becca, who still needs to be brought on the line. So I'm going to send her a quick email invite here because I don't see. Yes. All right, so there can be multiple causes of red S in the underfueling that occurs. So when we're taking in less energy through food than our body expends through exercise. We can do this intentionally or unintentionally. So it's really important to understand that while some athletes may be exhibiting disordered eating practices, others may just not be informed about the amount of food that their body needs and how to achieve these goals. So intentional underfueling is what we typically think about with disordered eating or an eating disorder. It can manifest through skipping meals, eating smaller portions, restricting foods or food groups, and this typically occurs with the goal of concerning um, with controlling weight. This can be a result of body image concerns from an individual, a coach, a parent. So with these patients, it's important to dig in and find out what their eating schedule looks like. You can also um, understand these concerns from the perspective of a parent or a coach. Okay, and then we can also have unintentional underfueling, which is what I stated earlier. This can occur when athletes um, enter a very challenging high volume period in their training and aren't necessarily aware of the extra food intake that their body needs. Um, it can also occur with athletes who are on very busy schedules. So if you have a patient who tells you they're involved in numerous sports during the same time period or, you know, doing two a day practices, sometimes it can be important to ask what their schedule looks like and if they're able to eat two meal, two, three, four meals a day plus snacks. This can also be a result of limited food access. So if we have an athlete who may have low socioeconomic status, may have trouble getting the amount of food they need, it's important to dig into those issues. Unintentional underfueling does occur without the goal of controlling body weight or composition, but it can result in weight loss, amenorrhea, the other consequences of red S that we've discussed. So, in order to identify red S, we need to know what kind of athletes are at risk. The athletes that I will describe to you are the most common individuals who can suffer from red S, but it's important to understand that red S can occur in any athlete. So regardless of age, gender, sport, or body size, we need to take these signs and symptoms seriously. If we have an athlete who may not be dangerously underweight, but they are exhibiting these behaviors, we can intervene early. We can get them the help they need so they don't have to go down that path of osteoporosis, um, amenorrhea, things of that nature. So uh, sports that emphasize weight like running, gymnastics, dance, especially wrestling with their weight classes can be a, a red flag. Um, athletes who experience pressures from coaches or support staff. So if maybe the athlete mentions, oh yeah, my coach wants me to lose a couple pounds for competition or I'm not at my race weight, that might be something to dig into. Um, vegan or vegetarian diets, while they can be done for ethical or environmental reasons, they're also a really easy way to restrict foods and food groups without getting attention drawn to it. So kind of dig in on the motivations for that to see if there's a cause for concern. Um, uh, additionally, medical conditions that re restrict foods or food groups, so for example, if an athlete has celiac disease and they have to restrict gluten, oftentimes that carbohydrate restriction may not be replaced with gluten-free forms of carbohydrate, and they may be missing out on a key source of energy their body needs. Um, other athletes describe perceived intolerances that have never been officially diagnosed, which allows them to you know, cut out meat, dairy, gluten, things like that. Um, so again, we can dig in and find out why that is. Um, puberty or periods of growth can be a big one, um, especially with female athletes who go through essential changes in body shape in order to um, go through puberty. 
this can cause a lot of discomfort, especially for athletes who are used to succeeding in sport at a certain body size or shape, and they find that their body is changing. So it's a good discussion to have. Um, again, we've got the disordered eating behaviors as a big red flag and then limited access to food. So some signs that you might get from an athlete who is uh, undergoing red S would be a preoccupation with food or body image. So especially if they say they want to tone down, they want to slim down, they want to reach that race weight. Um, with skipping meals or limiting portion sizes, like we discussed, you can hear that from the athlete or a concerned parent or coach. Uh, weight loss is an easy clinical sign. If you see that an athlete has lost a significant amount of weight in a short period of time, even if they've lost just a little bit of weight, if they're in a period of growth and you see that growth chart or that scale going in the opposite direction, that's something to uh, certainly look into. Um, engaging in additional training outside of practice, again, you want to check out those motivations because there is a line where we can go from, you know, dedication to training versus trying to achieve a certain body shape or size. Um, cold hands and feet, obviously in the COVID era, we're not uh, doing as much physical contact as we once were, but this can be a very easy to spot clinical sign. Uh, we've got the dry skin, nails, and hair that are certainly something you can observe upon uh, a visual inspection. And then a cycle of repetitive injuries or illness. You know, if we find that we're not getting enough calories to build bone rather than breaking it down, or if we're not getting enough calories to keep that immune system functioning properly, um, athletes can experience kind of this repetitive cycle. It can be frustrating for them. And working to resolve the energy imbalance can certainly get this going in the right direction. So this is just a little graphic with the impacts of Red S on health and performance. Um, I won't go through all of them in detail, but when you take a look at the impacts on health, um, we see with gastrointestinal, we can have a lot of constipation, um, immunological, again, we have lower immune function, higher risk of catching a cold, frequent illness, menstrual function. We can see amenorrhea. We also can see just skipping cycles, um, but not necessarily three in a row, but we can catch it early. Um, with bone health, again, we've got stress fractures. We've got low bone density and the path that can lead to um, with our hormonal functions in the endocrine system, um, metabolic, these athletes will be at a reduced metabolic rate, which can make the amount of calories their body needs to function even lower, pushing that athlete past uh, down a path of further restriction. And of course, when the athletes are young and they're in a stage of growth and development, not getting enough calories can really be detrimental to that. And it's important to touch on that psychological aspect as well, because a with Red S, we can see anxiety, depression, guilt, a lot of those associated feelings that we want to make sure we can seek the appropriate treatment for that. Sometimes the health effects can be hard for an athlete to really put into perspective when they are 100% focused on their sport. So in order to push them down the path to get the treatment they need, we do need to touch on the performance realm as well. So one thing that tends to hit home with a lot of athletes is decreased muscle size and strength. When we're in a consistent calorie deficit and we have that low energy availability, we are unable to build muscle. We can't build muscle when we're in a deficit. Athletes are often looking to build muscle, get stronger, get faster. So that can be a real uh, something that hits home with the athletes. We can also see decreased endurance performance. So while there is a myth that lighter is faster, that only lasts for so long because our bodies can't run on this limited amount of energy. So we see, um, especially in sports like running, we see athletes have slower times. It can be very frustrating for them. Again, we've got the injury and illness risk. And then decreased training response is another one I've found to really hit home with athletes. So when we're putting in this hard work on the field, on the court, on the cross country course, um, if we're not giving our bodies the appropriate fuel, we're not able to take advantage of that training. So do we really want to dedicate ourselves to this training without 
giving the fuel we need to take advantage of it. Um, and again, on that other side of the chart, we do have the depression, the irritability, the de decreased concentration that can come along with red S. So you might have to approach the topic differently depending on your athlete's health and performance focus and what seems to be most important to each individual. So there are a couple ways a dietitian can help with red S. The first step is prevention. Of course, a lot of times when red S symptoms have already developed, we're not at the stage where prevention is our top priority. We're really focusing on managing and treating. And, um, but if we can get in on the prevention end, that is even better. So a dietitian can help determine an athlete's energy needs, so how many calories they need to support not only their physical activity, but also their normal growth and development that their bodies are still going through. Um, there's a lot of online calculators and apps that do this. However, these are typically tailored towards the general population, which is going to have a lower metabolic rate, their muscles aren't rebuilding and recovering all the time, and you know they're also generally less active. So a dietitian can provide a more accurate um, energy calculation. Um, every time I work with a patient, we go through a day of eating and I do a nutrient analysis on it. So this can really help us identify gaps in the diet that we can address through either food or supplementation. So we could find out, for example, that an athlete is, uh, they recently changed their diet and they have cut out major sources of protein. Um, we can take a look at that, we can find it out, and then we can come up with a plan to incorporate that. Um, we can also catch low intake of iron, calcium, um, even things like zinc and vitamin C that keep our immune systems healthy. But uh, sometimes it takes a second pair of eyes to go really dig in and analyze that diet to find these things. Um, once we've identified how much energy an athlete needs and what nutrient gaps we need to address, we come up with a plan to match their training phases. Um, so this is a one-on-one -on -one with the athlete where we really collaborate and talk about their lifestyle to figure out something that's going to work for them. Because I can't just send someone out the door and say, hey, you need 3,000 calories, good luck. You know, we figure out how it's gonna work for them. Um, so that also comes with recommending specific meals and snacks. You know, we've got lots of recipes. We've got a lot of resources we can share. Um, you know, when it comes to injury and illness, when we catch an athlete before they've entered that cycle of injury and illness, we can intervene and say, hey, these are the things that you need to do from a nutrition perspective so we don't go down that energy path. And then, of course, um, resources for grocery shopping, meal planning, all the technical aspects. All right, so then management and treatment. Like I said earlier, this is going to be once an athlete has already started showing these signs and symptoms of red S, what can we do to manage it and get that athlete back on the path to, whether it be back on the path to competition and performance at a high level, or just back on the path to health and normal growth and development. So we can determine energy needs and assist an athlete with weight restoration because when an athlete's reached a low weight, and I just say, hey, you got to eat 3,000 calories. We got to get you to gain some weight. You know, that's not necessarily realistic in the mind of this athlete. So we work together to make a realistic strategy to help that athlete achieve a healthy body weight in a way that they're actually going to do. Um, of course, when we are injured or, illness or ill in that cycle, um, we can come up with a nutrition plan for that. Um, we address any nutrient deficiencies that the athlete has already displayed. So for example, we get the labs back and, you know, we've got low iron, we've got low vitamin D, um, anything of that nature. Um, we can also manage allergies and intolerances. So if an athlete has been diagnosed with celiac disease, a peanut allergy, a shellfish allergy, anything like that, a dietitian can help plan a diet that excludes the foods that don't work for that athlete but offers replacements and suggestions so we don't cut out sources of important nutrients. And then we can also do medical nutrition therapy to help manage or treat medical conditions. So let's say we have an athlete who has type one diabetes. You know, that's something where fueling is gonna be very challenging and it might not be appropriate to just, you know, tell that athlete, yep, 
do the recommendations for the general population, you should be fine. We might need to dig in a little deeper and come up with a plan to help them achieve their best health and performance. And then once an athlete, you know, if an athlete's out of sport due to the red S symptoms, um, a dietitian can help recommend that return to sport protocol based on their energy availability. So, you know, we can ramp their intake up and correlate a, an appropriate return to physical activity so we don't put them back in an energy deficit or return them too soon. Okay, and I think that is it. Yep. Okay. All right. So we should include your contact information when we send this out. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, if there are any questions that come up, please feel free to reach out to either Dr. Woodruff or to um, Becca Mellon regarding female athlete tri triad and or you can reach out to your provider relations team. Um, and other than that, we just wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And as a reminder, we will be posting this as well. So thanks again, and we'll talk soon.